This presentation includes forward-looking statements that are subject to risks and uncertainties. Actual results may differ materially as a result of various risk factors, including those described in the 10Ks, 10Qs, and 8Ks VMware files with the SEC. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Craig McLucky. All right. Well, welcome to the afternoon session here. Um, I'm Craig. Um, I've been at VMware for about nine months, and it's been a whole hell of a lot of fun, I can tell you that much. Uh, uh, a lot of really interesting developments over the last few months. And I'm really excited to have an opportunity to spend a little bit of time with you to talk through some of that. Um, and I'll be bringing up some of my friends. Uh, so, you know, we have uh, James Waters, someone I've worked with on and off for quite a while as part of this open source ecosystem. And he'll be talking a little bit around some of you know, Pivotal's aspirations in the space and how we're coming together to address a lot of the challenges of, of building more progressive cloud native apps. And I'll also be introducing a friend of mine from Verizon who I've been working with for a little while uh, who will provide a sort of a slightly different perspective on you know, what a lot of the technologies that we're investing in here really mean to the industry. Um, so let's kind of jump in. So um, hopefully you've seen this slide before. How many of you have seen this slide before? All right. OK, great. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a little bit of time today to kind of contextualize some of the investments we've been making in the cloud native apps space, of really thinking through this progression towards a modern application framework. And for those of you who um, know me, um, I've been in this, this kind of Kubernetes space for a little bit. Uh, I've been working on it for about as long as it's existed. Um, and it was interesting. When we started the project, we had a specific vision in mind, right? We had this idea that, like, hey, we can bring this new class of application management capability to the world. We can build it in the open. We can create an abstraction that represents a legitimately portable way to sort of bring together the world of on-premise and cloud, create something that looks almost precisely consistent from environment to environment. What we were trying to do with Kubernetes ultimately was what we always thought of as build this Goldilocks abstraction. We wanted to create something that was low enough level that you could run pretty much anything, high enough level that it would hide away a lot of the specifics of the environment and allow you to just focus on the application. And I think, uh, I'll, I'll say this honestly, like no one's been more surprised by the success of Kubernetes than me, right? Like, you know, as we said goes forth in this project, I don't think any of us anticipated the rate at which organizations were going to adopt Kubernetes. And in many ways, it became something more than just an infrastructure abstraction. It became a tool that organizations could start to think about as they approach this digital transformation ideal, as they start thinking about how to deploy their engineers to solve their business problems in a more efficient way, as they started thinking about how to build more interesting distributed systems to address the challenges that the modern business has. right? And as Kubernetes has emerged as this abstraction, as it started to become a staple in the, the daily life of operators and developers everywhere, it's introduced a whole new raft of problems. You know, some of those problems we could absolutely have anticipated, and we did. Uh, some of those problems were also new, right? And when you start thinking about it, you know, the first problem is this. It's still too dang hard to run. It's still too interesting, right? Your infrastructure should be boring. We should be in a world where we focus on the applications that power our business. We can rely on the infrastructure to just be there. It should be as boring as the electricity supply, right? You plug in a plug and you just get electricity. Kubernetes should do that for computational resources. We're not quite there yet. We still have some work to do to get to that point. And so our story from inside VMware's perspective really starts at that point. How do we make Kubernetes really, really boring? How do we make it just disappear into the background, right? And how do we do that on-prem, in the public cloud, at the network edge, with as much consistency as possible? That's one of the key things we'll be talking about today. Now, the other set, sort of interesting effect that occurred here was, OK, now we have this Kubernetes substrate. We kind of need to manage it. And I, I think another thing that sort of co certainly caught me off guard, you know, I've also been in the cloud space for a little bit. Um, I was responsible for building out a, a, a sort of infrastructure as a service offering in a, in a previous life. And I anticipated, and I think most of us did, that cloud would emerge as this force of consolidation. It was just going to make everything easier for everybody. 
because you'd just be able to you know, pick a provider, get this amazing infrastructure, highly elastic, APIs for everything, life would be great, right? Kind of didn't work out that way. I mean, it did in a way. It's incredibly powerful. There's a reason why we care about cloud. But for most practical enterprises, it's not a one cloud world. It's a two cloud world or a three cloud world. It's a cloud world and an on-prem world. It's a cloud world and an edge world. It's a GDPR partition cloud. It's 26 different geolocated facilities, each running the same thing over and over again. And that world of multiple clouds, multiple teams, multiple clusters, has introduced a lot of challenges from a management perspective. And we have to think through how to address that. And so we'll talk about that as well. And the final piece, and this is kind of really where I want to start, you know, the sort of in-depth part of our conversation today, is it's not enough to just deliver this infrastructure. You know, most organizations get incredibly hyped about Kubernetes. Like, oh, this stuff is really exciting. I read so many articles. It's really powerful. You talk to distributed systems engineers, and they're like, they're teary-eyed, and like, this is the system I always would have built if I just had the time, right? Um, but that's not enough, right? You've got to provide the mechanisms to actually get the applications on there. And there's different classes of applications that we care about. We care a lot about the applications that are running our businesses today. Like, you know, a lot of people say legacy. I love to say heritage, right? It's like, as my friend Joe always says, if you don't have legacy, you don't have money, right? This is the thing that's powering your business today. Treat it with some respect, right? And let's think through how are we going to be able to bring that forward. It's like, let's figure out how we're going to be able to make informed decisions around whether it makes sense to bring this into the container world, whether we can actually you know, split the difference. Maybe some pieces still live in the, in, the, in, the, in the traditional infrastructure that I already have, and portions of this can move forwards, right? It behooves us to also think through what does this mean from uh, an off-the-shelf software perspective, right? It's fascinating. So many conversations I have with Kubernetes these days are about organizations that are basically happy with the existing technologies. They're not particularly excited about you know, anything. It's like, oh, my IT kind of works. But this ISV came to me and said, if you want to deploy this new version of the software, it has to run in Kubernetes. And we're like, and so what is this Kubernetes thing, right? Um, so there's an impetus to be able to deal with modern software solutions that are being packaged and deployed into Kubernetes. And we need to think that through, right? Like we need to, we need to tell a story that enables us to really bring those applications into a consistent management framework. And then we also need to think through the, the world of cloud native applications. Like the next, what's next, what's fascinating, what's interesting? How do we go from where we are to stream-based processing, to event sort of based, functions of service, et cetera? And there's a lot, a lot, a lot of interesting stuff to be done there. So when we look at it all, you know, we've, we've spent a lot of time here trying to wrap this up in this new product portfolio, which we call Tanzu, or Tanzu. I keep saying Tanzu, but my marketing folks are going to get really angry with me in a second. Um, and what is Tanzu? Tanzu is, you know, there's a few things, right? Tanzu is, uh, it's modular cabinets. So if you think about the etymology of the word, um, you can go and buy these Tanzu cabinets. And I think that's kind of, you know, pretty representative of what we're trying to do here. Like, just another form of container that's modular, stackable, composable, sort of interesting. Uh, Tanzu is also uh, Swahili for branch. It's, if you look at uh, what we're doing with this Tanzu initiative, it's taking us down a new path from, you know, as a company. You know, when I look at you know, VMware, this is an all-in bet to make sure that we have a set of technologies that enable our customers to make that transition into this new multi-cloud, multi-team, multi-cluster world to make the absolute best they can out of these new classes of open source infrastructure technology that are emerging. And so for us, it really means a platform for running modern apps. And so to get into the kind of next level of detail, I'd like to invite my friend James Waters on stage. Uh, and he's going to talk about that sort of first point of the stack, which is how do we build these applications? Hey, thanks, Greg. Thanks, James. It's on? Still on? Yeah. You hear me OK? Excellent. So build. It's a, it's a big world of modern applications, and I've spent my last uh, several years working at Pivotal on what modern application patterns and practices and teams really look like. And we were one of the first companies that really started going to enterprises and saying, hey, there might be this trend called microservices. There might be this idea that you could continuously deliver applications that differentiate your business. 
And you might be able to operate more like Netflix than traditional enterprises. And that, several years ago, was a fairly radical idea. But I would say across, Pivotal now has around 400 Fortune you know, 1,000 clients that are doing that every day. And so our journey has been not only around modern applications, but especially for me, seeing how that transition to modern applications affects IT. And one of the most profound things that we've seen is that really when you think about automation of infrastructure, when you start at that application, that application is really what's essential. Like think about when you want to do updated and patching. You have to make sure that the patch that you're applying doesn't break the application, right? And so in our world, we build the infrastructure around the application. And that's the heart of a lot of the technology we're bringing to VMware and into Project Tanzu. And about every minute today, in an enterprise, Pivotal is building 100 containers um, for applications every minute, every day, 365. And those all run with our logic, our algorithms to keep those companies safe and secure. And so there are banks that enable every three-day patching of everything that they have in their environment through our approach because they know everything that an application needs, they can push a button and get it. That's really a profound change from the traditional ITIL way of assembling app infrastructure from the bottom up. It says, as soon as Git changes, as soon as there's a change in the application code, let's re-render the entire infrastructure. If there's one big idea I can give you, it's that having computers start to render that infrastructure based on the application metadata is a profound change. And you can do profound things with both efficiency, security, and availability. So what we're doing as part of Project Tanzu is we're bringing all of that pivotal technology to the Kubernetes environment. And you know, while I was really working on modern application patterns uh, with Spring and at Pivotal, Craig and team were really manifesting you know, the, the most modern container infrastructure, and it's pretty exciting to see those two teams come together now in Project Tanzu. And we plan on having everything that we do available um, as a Kubernetes native service. So to give you some updates, today we have our classic Pivotal platform, like I said, runs you know, half a million or you know, a million applications in production every day. That's all coming to Kubernetes. We're expanding that developer experience to provide function as a service based off of Kafka streaming and other stream events um, with Pivotal Function Service. That's going to be available. On and on and on. Everything across our portfolio as part of this uh, integration into VMware is now available on Kubernetes. And that's a roadmap I'm really excited about. And you'll hear a lot more about it. So what does this mean, though? Like, is there an IT impact in all of this? I think that's one thing you know, I've, I've mentioned, but I want to double down on with this audience. We sort of have this unfair advantage of understanding what the developer needs because we have the most popular framework for enterprise applications in the world. Has anyone heard of Spring Boot in the room? Yeah, even, the, even most IT audiences, they understand. I think those developers are doing something with Spring Boot. Probably across the top five banks in the world, almost every microservice that's new is written in Spring Boot. And so every month, most Java developers are interacting with Pivotal's technology. And we're able to apply our automation to that framework. So we have an unfair advantage in terms of building our uh, container environments out. And so we've seen with our approach, you know, this 82% increase in software production. Like, th think about that. You know, I was working with a large insurance firm and they're like, yeah, you know, before the platform, we were able to deploy about every six months. We could only respond to the business every six months. And I said, how are you doing now? They said, three times a week. And that's the fundamental difference between when the infrastructure responds to the application and when the infrastructure has to be hand assembled per change. So that's a big difference. Um, the other thing is, is that there's a lot of variance in those stacks when you deploy them by hand. You might have a layer seven misconfiguration. You might have something off in how an application is doing auto healing. And those things can cause outages. With the pivotal approach, we've seen a 78% increase in operational efficiency because there's just less mistakes to made when you start with that application first mentality. Um, so we feel very confident heading into uh, VMware that we're bringing this community and this proven approach that has profound operational impacts. The other thing that happened though, like if I could summarize that's all been great, but what else did customers want? They really wanted two things, and I think this integration starts to address those. They wanted us to be more and more a part of their everyday IT fabric. You know, probably the number one thing I would get from a customer who's been using us for years, they'd come back and be like, this is amazing, but I want all of my IT to start to look like this. 
So I think the Tanzu project is a great down payment on deep integration into VMware stack and to provide one coherent managed column that's consistent across modern applications, containers, and VMs. The other thing customers really wanted is they wanted partnership from Pivotal in terms of how we help them address their legacy applications. And this is where our fastest growing service has been our app transformation partnerships. Well, we'll come in, pair with you, sit around a table, work through real-time priorities. What is it going to take to get your applications into containers? How can we work with your team to enable them to understand a CI, CD um, automation first culture? And what you're going to get on the other side of that application transformation engagement with Pivotal is a working set of pipelines that can deploy and update even your legacy applications into containers. And I think that's going to be a huge part of Project Tanzu. So that's just a sneak preview of some of the, I think, very exciting technology that's coming to Tanzu from Pivotal and from our consulting experience. And I'm going to hand it back to Craig to talk a little bit more about how ISVs play in this, this world. So I could not be more excited to have an opportunity to work with our friends at Pivotal. Um, and you know, the work that they've been doing to you know, provide that sort of pragmatic way to start bringing a lot of your sort of IT processes into these sort of much more dynamic you know, workflows is, is tremendously valuable. But when we think about the problem space, that represents you know, a significant chunk of the code that you're writing. It's the code that you're writing. And it's absolutely critical that your developers are spending every moment they can really focusing on solving those business problems. But when you think about the problem holistically, when you think about what is you know, being composed to bring into your production environments, that only represents you know, one portion of the application workload. The other big part of that is, is third-party code, right? Like when you're building these applications, a lot of what your engineers are doing is really assembling existing uh, off-the-shelf componentry, open source projects, commercial uh, technology, bringing that together. So when we think about this problem space holistically, it really starts to look like a modern software supply chain. Your developers are writing code. They're evolving that code at the rate of the business needs. But they're also mixing in a lot of these third-party you know, third components, libraries, projects, et cetera. And so one of the things that you know, we did inside VMware was we acquired this little company called Bitnami. Like, how many of you have heard of Bitnami? Right. Bitnami runs a shocking amount of the world's uh, compute workloads. When you actually look at the origins of the images that run inside the public clouds, Bitnami represents a surprising amount um, of, of that workload. You know, one and a half billion uh, compute hours per year. If you actually worked that out, I did the math before, it's about 170,000 years of compute per year are being run uh, on these Bitnami images. And so as we think about this modern software supply chain and what we think about what our developers are going to need, we need to be able to assemble those pieces. And Bitnami represents a wonderful base of carefully curated open source projects that you can start using and mixing together. And so that community catalog, you know, and bringing that community catalog to this environment represents a very important first step. But it's not just about those free open source projects. It's not just about the curation of Bitnami and the, and the capabilities that they offer to create those, those, those wonderful baseline images. It's also about the third party software, the commercial software that's powering your business. And we've been working you know, pretty closely with some key vendors in the space to start to be able to assemble a set of solutions that can be brought to bear and run in the Tanzu environment. And you know, you know, take a look. This is an important set of, of, of folks. These are folks that are really driving a lot of that next gen application architecture. Uh, and we're really excited to be able to work with them. So that really closes out the story for us. We now have the capabilities to produce those progressive cloud native applications. We can bring to bear the skills you need to embark on that app transformation journey. And you can mix in both commercial uh, and open source pieces to create this holistic build story. But it's not just about the building of these applications. Let's talk about the running of them. When we think about Kubernetes, it comes back to that ubiquitous fabric, as boring as the electricity supply. And there's a set of attributes that we think are really important and that we're investing in heavily. And these are attributes not just of what VMware is bringing to the mix, but these are attributes that VMware is actually uplifting the open source community around. We're entirely committed to the future of the Kubernetes project. We're investing a tremendous base of resources into making Kubernetes better for everyone, whether you're buying our commercial offerings or not, whether you're buying an offering from one of our competitors. They are still, you're still benefiting 
from our contributions to that project. In fact, if you look at you know, VMware over the last year, we're now emerged as a top three contributor to the Kubernetes project, uh, which is you know, remarkable given that you know, a lot of folks don't look at us as an open source company. We are absolutely an open source company these days. And it's not enough to just invest in Kubernetes, right? It's not enough to just participate in the carrying of uh, you know, water and the chopping of wood, as we like to say. We're also invested in working around a lot of the tragedy of the commons. You know, one of the things I'd like to apologize for, for, for folks that have you know, worked in the Kubernetes ecosystem, is that we as a community just haven't invested in addressing some of the commonalities around you know, integrated cluster lifecycle management. The level of investment that the vendor community has put into just making upstream Kubernetes directly consumable is not enough. And that's one of the areas that we're absolutely committed to inside VMware. We're committed to creating a coherent, upstream-friendly, well-aligned way of getting Kubernetes integrated and consuming it anywhere you go, whether that's on-prem, in the cloud, anywhere. And we're looking at making sure that no matter where you go, whether it's to the network edge, whether it's to the public cloud, or whether it's in the software-defined data center running vSphere, you're going to experience the same tool chain, same basic OS, same network interfaces, same runtime capabilities. The value of this is really in the consistency. You know, I always say this, developers can deal with complexity. It's very hard to deal with inconsistency. So creating this ubiquitous this environment, which has the same tools, it has the same operating parameters, and it's entirely coherent no matter where you go, just makes a lot of sense. Like, you know, there's a lot of folks that will stand up here and say, hey, you know, cloud arbitrage, let's like, create this sort of ubiquitous platform that lets you pick the cloud provider based on the economics. There's going to be a future where we will see more portability. But the reality is that there's also going to be gravity associated with these clouds. The thing that I think is absolutely critical is that you have the ability for your developers to pick the environment that makes sense for their needs. And also recognize that as we move into this future, as we see fragmentation as a result of new privacy laws emerging, as we start having to deal with the mechanics of deploying applications into a highly fragmented environment, we have the right tools, and it's consistent wherever you go. Now, when we start like, peeling back the covers a little bit and looking at the investments that we're making, there's you know, three areas that we think a lot about as we start deploying Kubernetes. And those are obvious, right? There's how do we make Kubernetes run in the software-defined data center? And one of the things that we've been you know, extremely excited about is this Project Pacific effort, which is not just bringing Kubernetes to the software-defined data center, but accelerating the software-defined data center with Kubernetes, like making it so intrinsic that it actually makes the, the product better. But we can't constrain our attention to that. For a lot of our customers, they also want to be able to run in the public cloud. They need to be able to deploy Kubernetes on AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, Oracle Cloud, IBM Cloud, you know, pick the cloud provider. We have to have a story that creates a consistent operating environment in each of those, those places. And for some customers, the right answer is going to be AKS, EKS, GKE. There's some situations where perhaps it makes sense to be able to use one of those CSP-provided Kubernetes offerings. They, they work great in development context, for example. But for a lot of our customers, they want more customizability. You know, one of the key challenges we see with an AKS, an EKS, and a GKE is that as you start moving down the path towards running more regulated workloads, as you start dealing with the mechanics of your specific cybersecurity program, you need access to the control plane. You want to add your admission controller. You want to set the API server flags. You want to be able to access cluster log information so you can attest that everything's going the way it should be. And it's kind of tough to do that with some of those offerings. So what we've constructed as part of the Tanzu run framework is a cluster lifecycle management capability that will give you a perfectly formed essential PKS cluster in that cloud environment at the other end of a button click. It's your cluster. You own it. But we'll help you run it. We'll upgrade it, we'll watch it, we'll make sure it's healthy, and we'll support that through mission control. And I think that capability to really own and curate that cluster, have it fit into your environment, have it subject to your already approved cloud provider-based policies, be able to deal with it as a resource that's, that's part of your own program, just makes a tremendous amount of sense. And then being able to link that into our mission control fabric so that you can kind of start to manage it makes it doubly powerful. And then we'd be remiss not to look at edge. There's so much resource being pushed out to the computational edge these days, or the network edge these days. I work with telcos that are actively going through the process of figuring out 
how to get Kubernetes out to thousands of edge locations, right, to run the NFE capabilities. I work with retailers that are looking at pushing Kubernetes out to thousands or tens of thousands of retail locations. Not, not many tens of thousands, one tens of thousands, but you know, still it's a lot of edge, edge compute. And that introduces its own challenges, right? And so you know, when we think about this program that we're building, when we think about what Tanzu really represents, that grid needs to be ubiquitous, and it needs to be as boring as we can make it. So let me kind of just take a moment to you know, sort of dig into this. This is one of the biggest pieces of news at the show. And like, you know, as I've, you know, so I, I joined VMware from Heptio. Um, and this, you know, when, when, I, when I really got wind of what the ambition was around this, it, it was very exciting to me, right? Like, I've been in the Kubernetes game for a little bit. The thing that's exciting about Project Pacific is, yes, Kubernetes is great. We all love Kubernetes, right? But there's situations where, you know, maybe Kubernetes represents only a portion of what you want. You want to be able to mix in virtual machine-based workloads, right? There's a lot of stuff which just shouldn't be containerized right now. Look, we're working hard to push that envelope to make Kubernetes and, and sort of modern Linux application containers applicable for a wide array of workloads, but we're not there yet. And so what this is starting to do is tear down the distinctions between virtual machine-based management and container-based management. Thinking about your workload holistically and being able to you know, pick the right destination based on what you're doing. But it's more than that. It's also about accelerating vSphere with Kubernetes. There's a reason that Kubernetes is so successful. Yeah, containers are great. Yeah, it brings a lot of the orchestration capabilities. But it also provides the baseline for modern API-driven, declaratively managed IT capabilities. It's creating a new, a new, a new way of, of thinking about managing systems, like re relying on modern control-based reconciliation of your IT practices. Bringing that capability into vSphere is incredibly powerful. We're moving into a world where development teams demand modern, dynamic, API-driven infrastructure. And with Project Pacific, we're bringing that to vSphere in a very, very meaningful way. So I think this is you know, one of the things that, that's coming out of this show that I'm personally most excited about. And with that, I'd like to hand it off to my friend Nanda from Verizon, who's been you know, working on this problem. He can provide a little bit more context from uh, an organization that's pretty far down this journey. Thanks, Greg. Hello, everyone. So the perspective that I want to share today um, is a little bit different from you know, what you heard from James and, and Craig. Uh, especially with Verizon, you know, for the last 18 months or so, we've been on this journey and some of the challenges we faced as part of this. So I'm hoping the next 10 minutes I can help you understand, you know, why an initiative like Tanzu is going to be really critical uh, in terms of uh, as you consider going down this path and, and focus on transformation within your organization. And, and towards the tail end of this uh, presentation, I'm hoping I can also give you some uh, approach towards you know, how you can make a case towards your management for why this investment is needed and so forth, so that all this investment and, and technology capabilities that uh, Craig and team have been talking about can really be benefited for the organization. So starting with uh, Verizon, uh, I hope uh, I probably have to do less of an introduction, given the fact that you probably have seen the video, uh, the keynote yesterday on Verizon and who we are. Uh, maybe I'll just touch upon a couple of things, but especially for folks here in the States who might not be familiar with uh, Verizon, outside of being known for the, uh, the consumer space, is our investment in, in Think Space and Verizon Connect. Uh, especially, uh, we manage the largest telematics uh, ecosystem today. Uh, that's a little bit of an unknown uh, when you talk about Verizon and when you focus more on the, the um, telematics side of it. So most of my, my focus today is going to be on our transformation journey and, and the challenges that we faced and, and uh, how we really had to um, solve for some of this. And we're hoping with the Project Tanju uh, how we're going to be leveraging these capabilities. And the special emphasis that I'll ask of you on this slide to focus on is the efficiency, speed, and innovation, because that's where I'm going to be drilling down into. When you do this transformation, you know, what's the real output? Because transformation is kind of a buzzword. It could be many things uh, and so forth. Right? So you really have to be able to articulate when, when everything is said and done, what's the value for the organization. So I'm going to double click on the efficiency, speed, innovation, and really talk about you know, how you can drive this, especially from a platform engineering uh, aspect of things. So 
when we started our transformation, the, the challenge was, uh, you know, we were going to look at leveraging multiple clouds because there are different types of workloads for an organization of a scale where, it, you know, one particular cloud provider is not going to be sufficient. And there are going to be certain workloads that's going to be running on-prem uh, because of the nature of um, the data that it owns and manages and so forth. So multi-cloud is a given aspect of it. But the fundamental challenge that we ran into, and this is a discussion I've been having with Craig and team for quite some time now, is that managing this ecosystem is not easy. You know, especially when you deal with one cloud, it's one thing, but when you go across different cloud providers, it brings in uh, you know, different types of challenges. So our ambition and goal was, you know, how do you go away from this snowflake model and, and try to establish this consistent process, not only for our developers, but for operators, for security, and, and so forth, so that you get this single pane of glass of how you have to manage things and so forth. So this is kind of where, what we were after and how we had to solve for it. So the question now is, okay, this is good. How I, am I tying this back into our efficiency, speed, and innovation aspect of what we want to drive the transformation? So we took a page out of Amazon's um, flywheel strategy. I'm sure most of you are familiar by now with how Amazon actually drives this in terms of you know, the various products and services that they offer. So what we want to do was is to take this concept and apply it in, in terms of when you operate platforms and how do you really drive that. So fundamentally for us, the key aspect as part of this transformation was to make sure that we have frictionless experience for our developers. The reason for that is because if, when we look at simplifying software development lifecycle, and that's what you heard uh, James and Craig talk about, this really leads to a paradigm shift where you can bring on more apps onto the platform. Because now developers get excited, they see the ease of using these platforms, and they really want to bring more and more applications onto this platform and leverage it. This, in turn, has got the effect of how we achieved our cost efficiencies. So in our transformation objective, one of the pillars was efficiency. And we got that efficiency by really streamlining how and where we run workloads. And, and by getting more workloads run on it, you really get a good ROI in terms of the operational costs associated with running on these platforms. The second dimension that brings in, that completes this flywheel to some extent, is that now you get more standard features that you add on. That's kind of what I'm excited about Tanzu is that yes, it's a good foundation, but the long run, especially from all the vendors and ecosystem partners that will be added on, it will now give us the single pane of glass that we can take advantage of. So it really completes the cycle of I have a simplified process, I get more apps, I have cost efficiency, but more importantly, I can keep on adding more features and developers get excited about it. But there are two key things that actually benefit from this. And that's how it completes our transformation journey in terms of speed and innovation, is because we could do all of this and taking advantage of a platform like Tanzu, that you really now are able to drive faster time to market. So that's the key byproduct that we have started to see. And then we really want to double down on leveraging a platform like Tanzu is because as we go through the cycle, now our developers are able to focus more on you know, time to market and not having to deal with the infrastructure, and to Craig's point, really make the infrastructure to be like electricity, where you don't have to worry, it is just there when you need it. And finally, to complete this cycle, you really get into innovation. Because now teams can focus on, hey, what's the next cool product that I have to build, and how does it drive the innovation associated with that products and services? So this is kind of, in a nutshell, uh, a perspective of how we think about transformation and how, why we want to rely on consistent standard platforms. So one of the key takeaways I hope that you can uh, leverage from this is when you go back and you talk to your um, executives and your focus, uh, your focus on, the, on the organization transformation, you can really talk about you know, how do you simplify it, how do you benefit from cost efficiencies, how do you benefit from time to market, and eventually you know, how do you drive innovation. Right? So the other four dimensions that was very important for us is that you know, for the different players in the ecosystem, because you really have to make sure that your developers get excited about this, your security folks are excited about this, your operational folks, and finally, from an ROI standpoint, the key executives align on this. So to us, these four dimensions were very critical, where we wanted to simplify things for developers when they come on, use the platform, and, and uh, be able to build products. But with security, it was actually a big game changer. Because so far, this has been a big challenge when you talk about public cloud and you talk about software development, is security had been very siloed. You had security at different segments of software development lifecycle. So when you talk about Docker and Kubernetes and, and a platform like Tanzu, you're now you're able to bring all of it together because now you can really see that security artifact carrying over all the way from development to production. So that's a key benefit that you get from 
you know, getting that visibility and, and having that continuity all the way through the life cycle. And then from an operation standpoint, this is, I think, is a big win. Because I'm pretty sure that if you go and talk to any two application teams, even though they may be Java applications or Spring Boot applications, they'll say their application is very unique because it runs on different versions and so forth. One of the big advantage point of leveraging a platform like Kubernetes and an overlay platform like Tanzu is that how do you create that standardization? How do you create that way where you can manage that operations of two applications and, and, and try to manage that efficiently? And finally, from an ROI, and this is going to be a key factor that I hope you'll be able to make a case with your executives is the investment that you, for the return of investment on, on the platforms like Tanzu is because now you can really scale more applications run on it. You get some cost efficiency aspect of it. And, and you can really eliminate some of the outer architecture services that have to be uh, run independently and so forth. So this, in a nutshell, I hope gives you a framework for you know, how you can get different people in the organization excited to embrace on a transformation journey, because unless everyone feels a part to it, they're not going to participate. So finally, I'll leave you with, um, you know, if you're thinking about expanding this at scale, at least from our point of view, there are three major areas that we focused on. A platform, like what we've been talking about and why you need uh, something like Tanzu to really manage that multi-cloud experience. Focusing on the ROI, because end of the day, the, the real value is going to come from, hey, what do I get from you know, building these products and services? What's the ROI for it? And, and how, how do my customers benefit from it? How do my you know, employees benefit from the products and services that we run? And then finally, the people part of it. So what we did in Verizon is we focused on a few talent transformation initiatives where, to the things that James talked about, we have a dojo services which really helps teams that says, if you need some handholding to be done, you know, how can we help you? How can we support you with that transformation? Right? And then especially focused on you know, creating that awareness and really embracing the, the technology transformation that's happening in the industry. So in a nutshell, as I summarize here, I hope you can able to get a perspective of how you position a transformation within an organization that emphasis, at least in our context, was efficiency, uh, speed, and innovation, but it could be different things on you know, what you're focused on. And then how do you really drive a buy-in from all the tenants in the organization? Because that's going to be key for driving a transformation and making a case for you know, why do we need to invest in a platform? And then finally, you know, getting the ROI associated with it. I hope that helps in terms of you know, how you can really drive large-scale transformation in the organization. Back to you, Craig. Thank you, Nanda. All right, so um, we talked a little bit about build. We talked a little bit about run. Let's spend some time talking about what it means to bring a management capability into this multi-cloud, multi-cluster, multi-team world. And at the end of the day, you know, as we start looking at this management framework, as we start thinking about the connective tissue that bridges your people structure and your infrastructure, that enables your development teams to connect to a, a pretty broad base of clusters, we need to make sure that we're catering to two audiences here, right? We have to cater to the developers, but we also have to cater to IT. We have to bring together this capability that enables the IT administrator and the centralized IT groups to start to deliver Kubernetes as a service to a broad set of organizational groups. And we need to make sure that we provide this capability so that you can attach not just clusters that you, know, you, you control, we control, but clusters that are provided you know, through other commercial offerings, right? So when we look at TANS emission control, it's really about you know, these three things. One, how do we deploy Kubernetes into a variety of environments, right? How do we create that really boring infrastructure capability? Deploy, upgrade, maintain, troubleshoot, et cetera. We need to deliver the operational capabilities so that as you start thinking about, you know, well, here's a cluster, but how do I get it set up and integrated into my identity and access management system? How do I do that consistently you know, every time? And then how do I harden it? How do I get into a world where you know, Kubernetes is not just uh, an infrastructure abstraction, but it's properly set up with all of the things that I need to run these regulated workloads or these, these sensitive workloads or these workloads that include highly uh, sort of HIPAA data or whatever the case might be. So this becomes challenging in this world where you have multiple clouds, multiple clusters, and teams that are blending this world where 
a developer might be interfacing with one cluster one day, and there might be a single mapping of cluster to team. But you might also be in a situation where that developer is delivering software to 10,000 clusters. Maybe you're building point of sale software. And that gets really hard, particularly when you start dealing with the challenges of like, optimizing that application, thinking through how do I deal with situations where things go wrong. And so that's what Tanzu Mission Control is really intended to address. And as a starting point for us, we introduced a pretty broad array of capabilities that we think are important to organizations. And behind each of these is a story. You know, we've obviously been in this space for a little while. Um, we've been building production Kubernetes clusters for enterprise organizations you know, since the beginning. And these capabilities consistently come up as challenges for organizations. Simple things like, how do I do backup recovery for a Kubernetes cluster? Well, we've invested in technology that makes it easy. It's called Valero. It's an open source project that enables you to not just back up what's being deployed into a cluster, but to maintain that associative property between that and the persistent volumes that back it. But now, how do you do that across a 1,000 clusters? How do you set this up so that if you're running a workload that is particularly sensitive, it's being properly backed up and have the ability to then restore it at a moment's notice, you know, potentially in a different cloud environment? Tanzu Mission Control does this. Uh, audit and compliance capabilities. Observability and diagnostics. Um, resource optimization, configuration control, et cetera. Behind each of these is a customer story, an organization that we've worked with in the past that's encountered an issue and that we've worked to address that issue. And we bring to bear both open source technology that's deployed into that cluster environment and the control plane elements that are needed to configure it and run it. But the thing that's particularly powerful about this is that it's not just about the clusters that you provision using Tanzu itself. It's also about all of those other clusters that exist out there. You may be using AKS, EKS, GKE. You may be using an OpenShift. Any conformant Kubernetes cluster can be brought into control by Tanzu Mission Control, and we can create a lot of these policy capabilities, these, uh, these configuration control capabilities, into that cluster environment. With that, I'd like to invite Aaron on stage to do a little bit of the demo of uh, Tanzu itself. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks, Craig. So I'm super excited to show you a little bit more concretely what we're actually building into Tanzu Mission Control. Um, so Tanzu Mission Control really provides this single control point for organizations to manage Kubernetes clusters across disparate environments. Um, Kubernetes, as we know, provides this great interface between dev and ops teams. But many organizations that we work with are really stuck in these ticket-driven workflows and this operational toil. So what we're trying to do with Tanzu Mission Control is provide the right control for operations teams, but provide the right self-service access to development teams so those development teams can move quickly. Um, I'm gonna be driving this demo from the UI, but Tanzu Mission Control is a modern cloud system uh, with uh, APIs and a CLI as well. Um, so as an operator, I would be able to view um, all of the Kubernetes clusters running across my organization. And as you can see, those are located in many different environments. We can create clusters directly from a central place from Tanzu Mission Control, uh, but we can also attach clusters that are running anywhere. So, um, you know, as a Kubernetes operator, um, say I want to provide additional cap uh, capacity to my development teams. So I'm actually going to create a new cluster here. We can currently create a cluster on AWS, but we will be uh, adding additional public clouds as well as vSphere, leveraging Project Pacific. So that's something we're super excited about. Um, this cluster is driven by the same underlying cluster API te technology that we'll be using across the board. Provides a lot more um, you know, uh, customization than typically uh, other managed services provide, but provides a really easy way to actually create and manage the life cycle of these clusters. So I'm gonna choose a cluster name here and assign it to a cluster group. So cluster groups really enable me to group clusters across my organization to ensure that those clusters are uh, consistently, consistently secured, uh, that they're compliant, the same people have access, uh, and they look like, they, like I want them to. So here I'm creating a development cluster. I'm gonna add it to this development cluster group. I have a choice of a single node control plane development cluster or a three node control plane 
Uh, production cluster, again, all create a development cluster. And finally, this cluster automatically comes with one worker node. I know that's gonna be insufficient pretty quickly. I'm gonna scale this cluster up to five worker nodes. And then I'd hit create. I won't actually create this cluster here. It takes about six to eight minutes for those resources to actually be created and the cluster to come online. If I did, you would see something just like this development cluster two that we just created a few days ago. So now, you know, I'm a single operator. I've created this cluster. I wanna actually make sure that the rest of my operations team has access to this cluster. So by making this cluster part of this development cluster group, I've automated, automatically provided access to my entire operations team without doing any additional work. So let's actually see what that looks like. Here under the Tanzu demo organization, we can see that we have a number of cluster groups created. Here I can see that development cluster group that I just created, uh, that I just created the development cluster two under. And we can see that development cluster two. So what we're really enabling you to do here is group these clusters and ensure consistency. So any access policy that's set at this development cluster group level is automatically inherited to this development cluster two without me doing any additional work. And so mission control really provides this declarative access management without having to go into each cluster individually. And without something like Tanzu mission control, this is an incredibly error prone um, process and very manual. So you'll basically, as you many saw in the, the keynote this morning, uh, you basically have to go into each cluster, do these things very manually. Um, you can see here that I'm, I'm showing uh, access policies, um, but we're really focused on providing a lot of additional policy types to ensure that you can, uh, ensure that your clusters in, across your entire organization um, are secure, that they're compliant, and that you're using those resources efficiently. So I created this cluster. My development team still doesn't have access, so let's show what that looks like. So, um, modern applications typically run across uh, multiple clusters and oftentimes multiple clouds. What we're enabling uh, organizations to do here is to really create this isolated uh, development environment that runs across clusters. So as an operator, I can create this workspace concept and provide it to my application or team, and this, or the team that's building a new application. So this really provides this application or team-centric view across clusters. Here we can see that I have a, um, I'm building a fitness application, I have a Devon staging cluster group. And as part of this, or sorry, a, a Devon staging workspace. As part of this workspace, you can see that I have a number of namespaces. These are essentially isolated environments within single Kubernetes clusters. And you can see that I have a number of these that are actually running across multiple clusters, across multiple clouds. As an operator, I can create a new namespace myself, but more realistically, what I would wanna do is actually provide the development teams access to this workspace, enable them to create their own namespaces across these clusters. Um, so, you know, we, we're really excited about some of the policy aspects of this workspace concept and sharing clusters, but what gets really interesting is when you start thinking about consistent deployment of applications across clusters. Um, so you can consider you know, either modern cloud-native applications that were written to run on Kubernetes or off-the-shelf uh, apps as part of the Bitnami catalog. So that's really what we're looking to in the future. So finally, as an operator, you know, I'm responsible for ensuring that these clusters are actually healthy. So I can see some pretty high-level health information here. I can quickly dig in and see that this cluster here has an issue. We see some basic information on the cluster, utilization, the health of the uh, Kubernetes components, the health of the underlying nodes, and I can quickly see that this is where the issue is. So digging down just one step further, I can see the list of nodes that are part of this cluster, pretty quickly see where the issue is. So in this case, uh, our disk capacity is low. So this is actually a super easy fix, something that I can take care of really quickly. So in summary, you know, Tanzu Mission Control really enables us to provide this single control point for organizations to manage clusters, uh, no matter where these clusters are located, um, and, and really ensure consistency and automate a lot of the current processes that are super manual within organizations. Um, so um, last thing just to mention, you know, this is, 
the power of this platform becomes super exciting, right? When we start thinking about thousands of retail or edge locations or these shared clusters that are being accessed by thousands of developers. Back to you, Craig. All right, so uh, sort of wrapping it up. You know, our vision has really been about bringing this all together. Um, you know, today uh, we have, you know, put together what we consider to be an incredibly robust portfolio of technologies around Kubernetes in that sort of run segment with the VMware PKS offering. And we're very excited to be working towards this future with Project Pacific that's going to stitch things even deeper into the vSphere ecosystem. Uh, you saw Tanzu Mission Control, a multi-team, multi-cloud, multi-cluster management capability that's really ultimately going to be the bridge between that people structure and the infrastructure of the organization. And the real thing that you know, I think I personally am most excited about is that build space. It's how do we provide you the tools to not just create this infrastructure abstraction, but to enable both your existing applications to take advantage of some of these capabilities to provide the tools to give your developers superpowers, to be able to move them forwards with new development techniques, participate in this new software supply chain methodology, and bring forwards a lot of the common off-the-shelf software applications that power your business. So I think this vision is bold, it's comprehensive and holistic, uh, and I've been you know, really pleased to be a part of it to date. So you're gonna hear a lot more from us. So uh, you know, check out um, you know, our sort of story around Kubernetes here at VMworld. You can always take a snapshot of that little uh, icon, and, and we've, you know, we've obviously putting a, a tremendous amount of effort into um, Kubernetes itself and the investments in that space. And uh, you can also visit us at the Cloud City upstairs. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and wish you a very good afternoon. Thanks, folks.